Many sounds in a sport event are unpredictable. Thousands of sounds can occur, but this is imperceptible for you when sitting in your living room watching the game. But what is the main difference when you are listening to the game at home versus being in the stadium? Before ever. They're going to drive deep to right. This ball's going to go. David Ortiz, his 62nd home run against the Blue Jays. According to the CBS Sport Executive Vice President Ken Agar from J Digital Media in 2016, in the article bringing the game day experience to your viewers' ears, it's gotten to the point now that the audio experience on a NFL game and even a college football game is just as important as the video. If you are in home watching the game, you can hear the music, the announcer telling the player's name and different information, interviews, the bat hitting the ball, the squeaky shoes in the court, the ball, the basket sound, and of course the crowd. But is this audio enough for a fan watching the game at the living room? It's more, I think, focused on like the, the announcers than anything else. So you're more listening to them versus like the actual game. I would prefer being in the stadium. You don't get things like interviews or things like that, but anything that's natural, like actually being at a stadium, that's what you get. You know, the reaction of scoring a goal. And, but when you're at home, I'm still gonna react happy when a good thing happens, but I don't have like an as over the top reaction, I guess you could say about it. Behind the audio you listen at home, there is a lot of work. There is a truck company in charge of it. Inside the truck, we find the audio engineer A1. The truck is fully equipped with mixer, screens, microphones, speakers, and many inputs and outputs all necessary to do the job. And the job starts hours before the game begins. Usually, you'll set it, get there six hours before the game starts. The reality is, on a good day, it takes you two hours to set up. The A1 would be doing the mix. What's important is, when you're watching at home, you can understand what they're saying, and nothing's clipping. So what's going on on air is the way I think it should be. So, you know, like I'm the guy that does the Bruins, the Red Sox, and the Celtics. And one thing about TV is the show has to go on. You got to get it done. I mean, it's all the same principle. You're going to have announcers, you're going to have effect mics, you're going to have tape machines, and you're going to create a mix that sits right. In 2013, the article audio captured for sports broadcast by Bennett Lyles from Sound and Video Contractor mentioned that the most challenging aspect for an A1 of mixing any sport is working in different trucks. The truck is always where the event is. When you get into a truck, you have to take a look at the soundboard and then find out what the requirements of the show are. Just the A1's inside the truck. So right here is where the audio guy, he lives in his own little room. And the A2's are, are in the building. So the truck backs up and this is 10 feet away from the truck. They use a cable called what they call a DT12, which is a connector that has 12 microphone inputs in it. Whatever, uh, if I had the TD Garden, I got five DT12s coming that hit the back of the truck. Now I go to my patch bay and where those hit, I bring them to where I need them. So for sends and receives, so for microphones and sending mixes. The microphone placement is an important part done by the audio assistant A2. All are effect mics except the announcer. The article microphone uses for sports broadcasting by Helmut Wittek in 2013 from Live Production lists the main goals of a microphone arrangement in sports broadcasting. For all the announcers, you have to get their mics. You have to set up uh, mixes for their ears. We have mics that are set up, you know, like say for basketball, for instance, that are little lab mics that are under the nets. That gives that swish sound. We have shotgun mics that are pointed off the stanchions towards the foul line to pick up the sound of the ball and some chatter. And then we have mics that are pointed on the side of the court. 
so I can get them as they're going by. So I kind of follow it. Hockey, it's Mike's behind the gold on the plexiglass. Baseball, I have, I can have up to 20 mics. The big wall, I got mics inside there. So when that ball hits the metal, I pop that mic up and it's a big bang. The article Mixing Surround Sound for TV by Robert Edwards in 2013 from Broadcast Engineering point out the challenge of the huge dynamic range of a crowd. The compression is used more than anything else along with some EQ. You still need compression, you still need limiters, you, you still need all that stuff because you, you still got to deal with the dynamic range of TV. When they're whispering, you got to hear them and when they're yelling, they can't be clipping. Not do individual compression. My uh, announcers, I bring them to a group and I'll compress that group on pre-fade. Definitely compress my effects mics on a group. EQing, you know, you want to do your roll off, so I'll around 125 or so. On my final mix, I'll put a slight compression also. Another challenge in accordance of the article The Art of Audio Mixing for Sports by Getty Asco in 2015 from TV Technology Magazine is to get as immersive as possible the viewer while keeping the announcers clear and dominant in a stereo or surrounded 5.1 sound, always trying a 6 dB of separation between center channel where the announcers are and everything else. I want the person at home to feel like he's sitting in the ballpark because people with 5.1 system, they want to be hearing things out back there. And the people who hear it in stereo, we, we create a fold down of that that goes to stereo. People who work doing the audio mixing process for a sport even love what they do. Now that you know the process, you will like better watching the game at home.